Good evening. Welcome. I'm Jackie Ainley Conley, director of the Buffalo Bill Museum and Grave. I want to give a big thank you tonight to the American Mountaineering Center for hosting us this evening. A little plug. Um, if um, we really appreciate the support allowing us to use this auditorium this, and this beautiful building. If you'd like to support them, there's a donation box in the lobby on your way out, um, and it would be much appreciated. The Buffalo Bill Museum and Grave, owned and operated by the city and county in Denver, is in Lookout Mountain Park, part of the Denver Mountain Park system, and overlooks Golden. Currently, the museum is open Tuesday through Sunday from 10 a.m. to 5 p.m. The park, including Bill and Louise's grave site, is open year-round from one hour before sunrise to one hour after sunset. For more information about the museum and to view a portion of our collection online, it's a new feature, I encourage you to visit our brand new website at buffalobill.org. Yesterday, February 26, was William F. Buffalo Bill Cody's birthday. I'm excited to welcome you to the second of what we will hope will be an annual Buffalo Bill birthday talk. Tonight is our first in-person presentation, a video of our inaugural birthday lecture held last year via Zoom is available on our website, and that was Galloping Gourmet, Dining with Buffalo Bill with Steve Friesen, um, yeah, who's in the audience tonight. So you can see that talk on the website. I highly recommend it. It comes with recipes. When William F. Buffalo Bill Cody died in 1917, he was arguably the most well-known American in the world. A messenger on the early version of the Pony Express, Union veteran of the Civil War, and Army Scout, he hunted bison for the railroad, was the subject of dime novels, and traveled the US, Canada, and Europe with the Wild West. Oscar Wilde was a poet, journalist, editor, author, and playwright. He lectured on art and interior decorating and is perhaps best known today for his play, The Importance of Being Earnest, and the novel, The Picture of Dorian Gray. Tonight, Gregory Hinton will bring the stories of Cody and Wilde together about our speaker. Gregory Hinton is a nationally renowned playwright, historian, and keynote lecturer. Hinton's work explores the diverse cultural themes and how they relate to the community at large. A son of the rural Rocky Mountain West, Hinton devotes his energies to Out West, his National Museum Program series, offering lectures, films, plays, and gallery exhibitions dedicated to shining a light on LGBTQ history and culture in the American West. Hinton's father was the newspaper editor of the Cody Enterprise, founded by Buffalo Bill, and later the public affairs chief of the Bureau of Land Management. As a result, Cody, Gregory lived in Cody, Wyoming as a young child, and then here in nearby Green Mountain. He attended seventh grade in this building, the former jun Golden Junior High School, graduated from Bear Creek High School, and I hear we have some bears here tonight, and CU Boulder. Welcome Gregory Hinton. Happy birthday, Buffalo Bill. Thank you. Oscar Wilde in America, Buffalo Bill in England. In 2010, on a lecture tour of Montana, I came across a weathered copy of the story of the Wild West by Buffalo Bill. I can't claim to have read the entire thing, but on page 725, in the crawl of notables Cody met with on the tour of England in 1887, I found mention that he had dined with Mr. and Mrs. Oscar Wilde. Buffalo Bill and Oscar Wilde. <laughs> Years later, on a stroll through the remarkable collection of the Buffalo Bill Museum and Grave high up on Lookout Mountain, I happened upon a handwritten invitation to Cody from Mr. and Mrs. Oscar Wilde at home for tea, four o'clock, 16 Tite Street. When he didn't respond, 
Constance Wilde sent a follow-up note expressing that they would be so disappointed not to see him. An expense voucher listing 16 Tite Street, uh, Chelsea sealed the deal, so we know that he made it. The Buffalo Bill Museum and Grave holds among the most important caches of Cody, Wilde, and ephemera, papers, posters, programs, letters, and photographs of any museum anywhere. And much credit goes to its former director, Steve Friesen, who you all know, for his initial guidance and his wonderful book, Buffalo Bill, Scout, Showman, Visionary. And special thanks to Steve's very apt successor, director Jackie Ainley Conley. I'm so grateful to Jackie for holding space for my community in, this, in their museum and for making me laugh and for inviting this accidental historian to speak here today. In 1910, poet and independent historian uh, Richard Glanzer wrote uh, libraries uh, all over the United States uh, uh, requesting information um, when Oscar Wilde visited their town. The date of the lecture, the hall or theater in which he lectured, the advertised title of his lecture, the hotel at which he stopped, the place where he previously lectured, the next de destination, and any press clippings they might forward. And happily, many replied. And many may be viewed in the reading room of UCLA's Williams Andrews Clark Library. Look at the places we get to go. Um, repository of among the most respected collections of Wildeana in the United States, and just five miles from where I live. Buffalo Bill and Oscar Wilde both crossed paths in New York on January 9th, 1882. It's unknown if they, if they met each other that fateful week. A season regular at Brooklyn's Grand Opera House, Cody, the famous scout and his mammoth combination were booked for one week. Wilde, the, apostle, the apostle of aestheticism, or the Napoleon of the la dee -dahs, anxiously debut, debuted to a sold-out house of potential snickering at Chickering Hall on Fifth Avenue for the next four nights. Now, of the two, Cody must have felt Wilde's presence more. Uh, Chickering Hall was the kickoff to Wilde's American tour, and Wilde arrived in New York the week before at a considerable public fanfare, which ricocheted over the waters back to London. Enterprising reporters came out of the sea, Wilde observed, their pen still wet with brine. Wilde, it must be emphasized, was not prepared for the reporters, and the New York reporters were not prepared for him. Wilde's tour of America was preceded by the self-publication of his acclaimed edition poems and the opening of Gilbert and Sullivan's play, Patience, a direct parody of Wilde and aestheticism. At the suggestion of actress uh, Sarah Bernhardt, the powerful British theatrical producer Richard Doyle Card arranged for Wilde's lecture tour with hopes that the play and Oscar would cross-promote. And Wilde seems to have been the chief spokesman, if not the originator, of the aesthetic craze that be began about 1880. In the most general sense, the disciples of the aesthetic movement worship beauty, especially as found in art, music, architecture, fashion, and speech. When asked what Wilde thought of the crossing, he remarked that the Atlantic is not so majestic as I expected. A version of the quote was promptly cabled to England and became a poem in the Pall Mall Gazette called The Disappointed Deep. <laughs> now, Wilde was enormous in physical stature, broad-shouldered with big fists and taller than Cody by two inches. The press took digs at his appearance. A large, flat face reported the Evening Post, and instead of a feminine voice, Burley wrote the Tribune. Yes, as he intended for them to do, they mocked his fey mannerisms, the accessories, and the fact that he spoke in hexameters, as in Homer's Iliad. And although Wilde dressed conventionally on the street for a man of his status, when he took the stage at Chickering Hall, they expect the, his unexpected attire took the audience by surprise and was far more daring than anything in his lecture. He wore a dark purple sack coat lined with lavender satin, a full a frill of rich lace at the wrists, hair long, parted in the middle, knee breeches with black hose, low shoes with bright buckles, and the stage was dressed simply but beautifully. Wherever he appeared, the omnipresent sunflower and lily appeared with him because, as he ex explained, they were perfect models of design and inextricably tied to the aesthetic movement. Yet, his enlightened speech and his energetic delivery always stole the show. While lecturing in Ohio, much, after much audience hazing, Wilde had, to decide to, had decided to dress conventionally. 
from St. Louis, he hastily wired instructions. Go to a good costumer, theatrical, and get them to make you, you will not mention my name, two coats to wear at the matinee and perhaps in the evening. They should be beautiful, light velvet doublets with large flowered sleeves and little ruffs of cambric. Only knee breeches instead of long. They will excite a great sensation. They were dreadfully disappointed in Cincinnati at my not wearing knee breeches. <laughs> so of the media obsession, albeit much derisive, which followed wild to 150 cities, 50 in the American West, Cody might have both envied and admired Oscar Wilde. For Cody and Wilde, it was about press, good or bad, and tickets sold. In its ninth year, the Buffalo Bill combination had lost its steam, and Cody's career as a stage actor was on the wane. Wilde's journey, a, a year-long 1880 tour of America, was only just beginning. And for the purpose of tonight's discussion, I'd, I'd like to focus on a few significant stops. American notables clamored for Wilde's company, some to their great regret. Wilde was referred to her brother to Mrs. Julia Ward Howell, author of the Battle Hymn of Republic. Public reaction to her largest for hosting him at her home in Massachusetts required that she issue a statement of her reasons. Mr. Wilde is a bad young man. But to cut off an offending member of society from its best influence and most humanizing resources is scarcely Christian in any sense. Women are not merely the guardians of public purity, but they are the pure representatives of tender hope and divine compassion. Early in his tour, Wilde's long ambition to meet Walt Whitman came to fruition. When Wilde had gone up to Oxford, his mother had read Whitman's poems to her from a first edition of Leaves of Grass. Whitman had declined invitations to several parties in Philadelphia surrounding Wilde's lecture at the Horticulture Hall on January 17th. In an interview, Wilde extolled his great, his great admiration for both Emerson and Whitman. They have given the world more than anyone else, he said. In Camden, where Whitman was living with his brother, Wilde's wish came true. He must have labored over his first words, I come as a poet to call upon a poet. After dueling cleverness for the bulk of the interview, Wilde confided to Whitman that he couldn't listen to anyone unless he attracts me by a charming style or by beauty of theme. And Whitman rebuffed him. He said, it's always seemed to me that a fellow who makes a dead set of beauty by itself is in a bad way. Wilde, in an effort to be conciliatory, praised Whitman for flouting convention and resisting hostile criticism. Whitman's example seems to prove that America was more advanced than England. Yet, five months later, a sixth edition of Leaves and Grass was unexpectedly canceled because of threat of prosecution for many of its poems, including I Sing the Body Electric. Now, this sounds familiar. What's, what's old seems to be new again. Any scholarship of my community's literature inevitably starts with Whitman. My favorite poem is I Saw in Louisiana a Live Oak Growing. And years later, Walt Whitman defended Oscar Wilde for his love that dare not say its name. When trials for moral turpitude became public knowledge, and Wilde would forever proclaim that the kiss of Walt Whitman is still on my lips. When Oscar Wilde arrived on the morning train to Salt Lake, he was coming from Sacramento after a very successful performance. And the Salt Lake Tribune reported that he was the most observed by all the observers. At his hotel, a young busboy sported a sunflower, and ladies in the dining room wore lilies in their hair. The first item on Wilde's agenda was an afternoon visit with LDS President Taylor at his home. They later toured Salt Lake City. That evening, the Salt Lake Theater was crowded and expecting an evening of wit and levity. The citizens of Salt Lake were looking forward to the visit of Oscar Wilde, the singularly deep young man of the aesthetic movement. The Salt Lake Theater had presented patience to sold out audiences in order to introduce people to the Sunflower Apostle. The local newspapers began to advertise far in advance. His visit was, was well publicized. People were curious to see a man who still wore knee breeches and spoke of the virtues of sunflowers and lilies. Prices ranged from 25 cents for the cheap seats to $2.75 in the dress circle. And the Herald printed reminders of the lecture, exciting potential audiences as the Oscar, as they called him, approached. The title of his talk, Practical Application of Aesthetic Theory to Everyday Home and Life and Art Ornamentation. The Utah Historic 
Gold Quarterly posits that the subject was intriguing to Mormons who had successfully created an oasis of property, beauty, and culture on the edge of the Great Basin. Yet for many, Wilde's visit to Salt Lake turned out to be a great disappointment. Intellectuals, intellectuals in the movement adhered to the art for art's sake philosophy that beauty should be appreciated for itself and does not need a practical purpose. Wilde believed that man should surround himself with beautiful things such as furniture, paintings, wallpaper, and architecture in order to be happy. One must be careful to avoid creating ugly art, he said, even if it's useful because ugliness does not contribute to forming a morally good character. He called a horsehair sofa that old defender. And Wilde advocated for all who desire beautiful things beyond their means. A true artist is accountable to no one, but a handicraftsman is dependent on the pleasure of the buyer. And this philosophy was very attractive to many people in the 1880s. And Wilde espoused giving handicraftsmen examples of beautiful art. Wilde in costume was caught short when he came onto stage only to encounter the entire front row of young men adorned with enormous sunflowers. Clearly fatigued, Wilde was off his game as far as the oratory was involved, so reviews were not so good. The Deseret reported that he was an enthusiast without enthusiasm. <laughs> Next stop, Colorado. Posted in the Denver Daily Times of Tuesday, April 12, 1882. Mr. O. Wilde, a young Irishman who has been lecturing on art as viewed by Mr. Ruskin, talked in Salt Lake City last evening. He will arrive in Denver tomorrow evening in time to lecture at the Opera House. Newspaper men take particular interest in Oscar Wilde. This is owing to the fact that Mr. Doily Cart, Mr. Wilde's manager, has contrived to get such a large amount of free advertising for the useful estate. As Barnum remarks, we all like to be humbugged, and we like to see the object that has been instrumental in humbugging us, be it a codfish, mermaid, a singer, a lecturer, or a baby elephant. Farseur, mimic, and children's poet Eugene Field lived for a time in Denver. In anticipation of the impending lecture by Wilde at the Tabor Opera House, Field costumed himself as the character of Bunthorn in Gilbert and Sullivan's Patience and was driven through the streets in a caricature verisimilude of Oscar Wilde. When Wilde's train pulled into Denver, he was confused to learn it was thought he was already in town. When he found out, his only comment was, well, what a splendid advertisement for my lecture. And of much of the reportage on record of Oscar Wilde's tour of America, the Denver newspapers had the most fun. Oscar Wilde's advance agent this afternoon received the following brief but significant dispatch from the lecturer who is now on his way to Denver to lecture this evening. I have been told that Denver is a bad place and some mischievous young men will make it hot for me. If this be true, then I will bid farewell to my vow of peace. I am resolved to no longer tamely submit to being a target by rude young youngsters to shy things at. Having shown Americans what gentleness is, I am now determined to, to discard the forbearance and defend myself should circumstances demand it of me. I am practicing with my new revolver by shooting at sparrows on telegraph wires from the car. <laughs> my aim is as lethal as lightning. Mr. Oscar O'Flaherty O'Flanagan Wilde will arrive in Denver from Salt Lake City at seven o'clock this evening. He will then be driven to the Windsor, where supper will be awaiting him on blue china plates. He will reach the hotel at 7.25. 10 minutes will be devoted to his toilet, 15 minutes to his supper, five minutes to picking his teeth and attaining a comfortable composure, and five minutes will be occupied in driving him to the opera. It will then be 8.10, the time set for the beginnings of his lecture on art decoration, and the audience will be composed of Denver's finest people. And the reviews were positive. The Denver Daily Times wrote that the lecture delivered by Wilde at the Tabor Opera House was well worth hearing, adding with the caveat that while his mission may be that of a philosopher, his methods are those of a charlatan. But a man is not necessarily a fool because he wears a cap and bells. And Oscar Wilde is assuredly very far from being a fool. In the second editorial, Oscar's peculiarities, a length lengthy diatribe of his physical characteristics, odd face, Low flushed, roundness of the chin, narrowness of the mouth. It is an Irish mouth, and it is an Irish woman's mouth at that. <laughs> no offense to the Irish. <laughs> the article closes with, no offense is meant when it is said that Mr. Wilde is a physical intellectual paradox. No one doubts his poetic mind, though his physical construction 
be not in harmony with it. Among the best known and best loved of Wilde's most successful adventures on his American tour was his trip by rail up the Rockies to the mining town of Leadville. At 10,000 feet, feeling faint on arrival, he was treated for light air. In no time, he was dropped by bucket deep into the matchless mine with Silver King, Horace Tabor, holding the rope. Wilde was handed a silver drill to strike the first blow for a new mine to be called the Oscar. And he murmured his gratitude, uh, but posed that the shares in the mine might sweeten the pot. <laughs> he later quipped, from Salt Lake City, one travels over the great plains of Colorado up to the Rocky Mountains. to the top of Leadville, the richest city in the world. It has also got the reputation of being the roughest, and every man carries a revolver. I'm told that if I went there, they would be sure to shoot me or my traveling manager. And I wrote and told them that nothing they could do to my traveling manager would intimidate me. <laughs> they are miners working in metals, so I lectured to them the ethics of art. I read to them from passages from the autobiography of Benvenuto Cellini, and they seemed much delighted. I was reproved by one of my hearers for not having brought him with me, and I explained that he had been dead for some time, which elicited the in inquiry, well, who shot him? <laughs> they afterwards took me to a dancing saloon where I was the only rational method of art criticism, where I saw the only rational method of art criticism I've ever come across. Over the piano was printed a notice, please do not shoot the pianist, he is doing his best. The mortality among pianists in that place is marvelous, he said. Then they asked me to supper, and having accepted it, I had to descend a mine in a rickety bucket in which it was impossible to be graceful. In the heart of the mountain, I had supper, the first course being whiskey, the second course whiskey, and the third whiskey. <laughs> I went to the theater to lecture, and I was informed that just before I arrived, two men had been seized for committing a murder, and in that theater, they had been brought up on the stage at 8 o'clock in the e evening, and then and there were tried and executed via for a crowded audience. But I found these miners very charming and not at all rough. <laughs> Wilde stressed the importance of supporting local craftsmen and their handicrafts with an application of the aesthetic doctrine. According to Wilde, America's most well-dressed men were his beloved Colorado miners with their wide-brimmed hats and flowing cloaks. He said if he were a young man in this country, the West would hold great charms for him and if only poor Oscar had remained here. Five years later, Buffalo Bill and his Wild West first sailed across Oscar Wilde's disappointing Atlantic to find fame and fortune beyond Cody's wildest dreams. And Oscar Wilde was waiting for him on the other side at 16 Tite Street, Chelsea. In, 1880, in 1872, after first seeing his young life story reenacted as an Indian scout and buffalo hunter in Chicago's Bowery Theater, a stage struck William Cody sent a letter to his sister Julia expressing his intention to go to Europe in the fall. And from his most basic imaginings, before he ever conceived of Buffalo Bill's Wild West, Cody visualized himself as an American cultural export. Twelve years later, upon tending, attending Buffalo Bill's Wild West at Cody's invitation in 1884, Mark Twain, the patriotic author, wrote that it stirred me like a, a war song. Echoing Cody's earlier aspiration, the author closed with the admi admonition that none of the exhibitions we send to England are purely and distinctly American. If you will take the Wild West over there, you could remove that reproach. On Friday evening, August Oh, the, uh, in, in late August of 1886, a chance day cruise off the New England coast included key members of the board of directors of the forthcoming American Exhibition of Arts, Inventions, Manufactures, and Resources in London. Among those present included British entrepreneur John R. Whitley. The meeting was opportune. Henry Irving, the prominent actor and artistic director of London's renowned Lyceum Theater, was at the end of a five-week yachting tour on a rare pleasure trip to America with him. His muse, companion, and business partner celebrated actress Ellen Terry, and Irving took a deep interest in the American exhibition. I have a huge crush on her, by the way. <laughs> on Friday evening, August 27th, the group attended Buffalo Bill's Wild West at Aristina. Whitley planned to debut the exhibition the following spring in tandem with Queen Victoria's Golden Jubilee. Irving and Terry sailed the next day on the steamship Umbria for Liverpool. Irving later offered a rave review of Buffalo Bill's Wild West. I saw in 
entertainment in New York, the like of which I have never seen before, which impressed me immensely. It is an entertainment which the whole of which is most interesting episodes of, episodes of life on the extreme frontier of civilization in America are represented with the most graphic vi uh, vividness and scrupulosity of detail. You may form some idea of the scale upon in which the scene is played when I say that when I saw the stage, it extended over five acres. You have real cowboys with bucking horses, real buffalo, and great hordes of cows which are lassoed and stampeded in the most fantastic fashion imaginable. Then there are real Indians who execute attacks on the coaches, driven at full speed. No one can exaggerate the extreme excitement and go of the whole performance. The excitement is immense. When it comes to London, it will take the t town by storm. Like so many audience members before and after, Irving connected to the spectacle of its authenticity, the realness of its elements. On March 31st, 1887, hundreds of human souls, American Indians, Mexican vaqueros, cowboys, cowgirls, celebrated rifle shots, the original Deadwood stagecoach along with horses, steer, buffalo, elk, bear, camp equipment were all loaded onto the steamship state of Nebraska. To cheering crowds, they sailed out of New York Harbor while the Buffalo Bill Cowboy Band played The Girl I Left Behind Me. Two weeks later, to the dueling strains of the Star Spangled Banner and the Yankee Doodle Dandy, John R. Whitley, now director of the American Exhibition, Lord Ronald Gower, president of the Welcome Club, Wild West advance man John Burke and representatives of Wyoming's leading journals and the state of Nebraska bearing the company of Buffalo Bill's Wild West cast anchor off Gravesend near London. After ex 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 expedited customs and quarantine inspections, a special train of saloon carriages whisked Cody away to Victoria Station. His earlier anxious coincidental existential thoughts about arriving abated. Juxtaposing the quaint fishing boat to the mammoth Indian traders and ocean steamers with the dignity, un with the distinctly unique manifest he had just transported from the great American West gave Cody pause. Reflecting on the hardships of his youth and the remarkable journey to, the, to, to this place in time caused concern that Cody might not be up to the task. The hustle and bustle of the first evening view of mighty London conspired to lift his spirits. After a boisterous reception at Hotel Metropole, Cody retired early and retraced his step to Gravesend at dawn the next morning. Adept at moving massive numbers of animals, equipment, and people by mail by 6 p.m. that evening, the Wild West and Buffalo Bills of Nebraska, USA was at home in camp in London. Interspersed among the avalanche of invitations to Cody hallmarking the London social season of 1887, many in the wonderful collection of the Buffalo Bill Museum and Grave, the name Henry Irving is invoked by way of facili uh, as a facilitating influence in the introduction. Without question, Cody and others credited Irving, the preeminent 19th century British actor and theatrical producer, for paving his way to London. As the noticed war Western historian, Lewis Warren observes, it's surprising that no scholar has noticed how deeply Buffalo Bill Cody ingratiated himself into Irving's circle in that same period. At the turn of the 19th century, London boasts nearly, boasted nearly 200 gentlemen's clubs. Paul Mall, London's trendy club row, was frequented by men of science, literature, politics, nobility, and the arts. The most prestigious invitation Cody would receive that evening was the following. The chairman and members of the Reform School of a reform club, <laughs> request, the, <laughs> request the honor of Colonel Cody's, Cody's company on Wednesday, the 15th of June, in celebration of Her Majesty's uh, Jubilee and the 50th year of the club to meet their royal highnesses, the Prince of Wales and the Duke of Cambridge. Now, I was tempted to post photos of William and Harry in this slot, but I didn't. <laughs> Irving invited Cody to dinner at the Garrett Club the day after his arrival at Gravesend. And although Cody had been entertained in America's finest gentlemen clubs, to be hosted at the Garrick in the company of British Britain's leading actor was, must have been a huge honor. And so on Sunday evening, Irving and Terry visited the camp at Earl's Court in full costume to, oh, sorry, at Earl's Court at the American Exhibition grounds and buildings. Received by John Whitley, they, they greatly enjoyed themselves. The following Tuesday, Cody brought cast members of the Wild West in full costume to see Faust at the historic Lyceum Theater. Irving seated Buck Taylor, King of the Cowboys, and Red Shirt, Chief of the Indians, in the Royal Box, inviting Cowboys, Indians, and Cody on stage after the show. 
a cartoon with a towering Cody condescending to Irving and Royal Friends in miniature over the caption, you've been the best advance agents I ever had, and any time you'd like to see the show, you'd be mighty welcome. In fact, Irving had his own box at the show. Um, in May 15th, at the official opening of Earl's Court in Brompton, Lord Ronald Gower addressed an august assembly in, in the gardens. Gower, a sculptor, is best known for his statue of William Shakespeare at Stratford-on-Avon. A, queen, a friend of Queen Victoria, Gower himself had traveled by train across America in 1872. A member of Parliament, it was Gower who also per persuaded the former Prime Minister, the Right Honorable William Gladstone, to visit the American exhibition and attend a performance of Buffalo Bill's Wild West. On behalf of the Council, Gower spoke a capital piece of welcome to the American guests. He told them he represented a multitude of Englishmen from all walks of life, each animated by strong feelings of regard for America and the Americans. Amidst loud cheering, he expressed hope that the exhibition might be a bond between England and America. Um, a command performance, which was arranged for, for Queen Victoria, wrote that, the, that she saluted the flag for the first time in history. He regarded that as a diplomatic victory. When I was up in uh, Cody at the Buffalo Bill, they had just re received this poster. So I saw it. the only space they had for it was to lay it out on, a, on, an, on their stage. It was, it, was as, it was as long as this. It was, it was remarkable to get to see it in perfect condition. To this day, Henry Irving is regarded as one of the greatest Shakespearean actors in history, not just in England, but anywhere. Ellen Terry was the era's most powerful actor, actress. Irving and Terry arrived late in the popular American zeitgeist of the end of the century British theater. And together, Terry and Irving are credited for reviving English theater after assuming control of the Lyceum Theater in London's West End, 10 years before Buffalo Bill came to London. Both self-made, Cody and Irving had more in common than one might know. Like Cody, who after the death of his father, Isaac, was dispatched to the Great Plains to help fend for his mother and sisters, poverty separated Irving from his immediate family. Unable to feed him, his parents sent young, young Henry to live with a devout aunt in a remote mining community in Cornwall. It was Celtic country, a place of legend. It was also a place regularly visited by traveling company of actors, which would reenact blood and thunder melodramas and Shakespearean touring companies, informed in the children of Cornwall, a passion for dressing up. A thin, sickly boy, Henry Irving overcame a serious speech impediment by mastering awkward phrases through stubborn repetition. Irving's drive to transform physical obstacles into assets informed his stagecraft. Irving's famous gait and underscored drag of his fit, foot uh, tricked his audiences into underestimating him, turning early hissings into later ovations. To an actor, nothing is as deadly as being hissed. Henry Irving, who eventually conquered Shylock, Iago, Wolsey, and King Lear, had nothing to prove to any able-bodied man. In 1877, Irving engaged Bram Stoker, then a tall athletic clerk from the Dublin Civil Service, to quit his pension job to act as business manager of the Lyceum. A theater devotee and independent critic, Stoker, long a fan, had written a discerning critical article of an Irving performance. And intrigued, Irving asked uh, Stoker to supper in his rooms to discuss it. Now, you know that Bram Stoker is also the author of Dracula. And Irving read it and was terribly offended because he thought he was Dracula. And then I was told uh, uh, recently that Buffalo Bill uh, is the inspiration for Quincy, the man who slays Dracula. So we're, we're all involved again. A most intriguing observation we made about Irving, Terry, and Stoker is the utter complication of their private lives, attributes they shared with Cody. Ellen Terry married multiple times, but her most rounded significant life partnership was with Irving. As with Cody and his challenging marriage to his wife, Louisa, Irving remained married, though separated through, with, from his wife. The Lyceum was Irving, Terry's, and Stoker's love child, and life in the theater often spawns intense interpersonal relationships but they not, they, though not always with the theatrics of an illicit physical component. Buffalo Bill Cody and Henry Irving knew how to make an entrance, be it a traditional theatrical setting or a massive pu public outdoor exib exhibition. Conquering disruptions of each man's stage, stage persona suggested their sh shared capacity to compel the attention of audiences on both sides of the Atlantic. An 1888 account of West 
of, of the Wild West at Aristina positioned Cody as the culminating figure within the cavalcade of frontier spectacles. Cody, the far-famed Buffalo Bill, comes last, and I don't know that anybody has ever described Buffalo Bill on a horse. He is the complete restoration of the centaur. No one that I ever saw so adequately fulfills to the eye all the conditions of picturesque beauty, absolute grace, and perfect identity with his animal. Motion swings music into him. He is the only man I ever saw who rides as if he couldn't help it. And the sculptor and the soldier had jointly come together in his act. Alfred, Jacobs Bryan, Alfred Bryan's 1878 drawing at the play perfectly sets the stage for an Irving opening, accompanied by an appendix of prominent names which were published, many of the glitterati that Cody and London's 1887 Lion of the Season will be introduced to 10 years later. And they included the Prince and Princess of Wales, the publisher and theatrical producer Henry Labrachere, writer Edmund Yates, former Prime Minister, the Right Honorable W. E. Gladstone, the actress Lily Langtree, comic opera producers Gilbert and Sullivan, the Marquis of Queensbury, who would later bring the ultimate downfall of Oscar Wilde, and the painter James Whistler, Wilde's tight street neighbor and uh, constant sparring partner and irritant. At the play beautifully complements this painterly article about a Lyceum opening by theatrical writer J.B. Booth. We enter the steps and the heavily carpeted vestibule from which an immensely wide staircase covered with thick, soft carpets. At the top of the staircase, a tall man in evening dress greets us. It's Bram Stoker, Irving's faithful friend and manager. To Bram, his chief is a god who can do no wrong. The audience qu quietly uh, and slowly settles in its seats. The murmur of voices dies down, and there is a curious hush of expectancy. The overhead finishes, the lighthouse dies down and the curtain, the lights, house lights die down and the curtain rises. At last, the entrance of the well-known figure, the tones of the familiar voice, and the lyceum roar of greeting. Oscar Wilde had yet to write his famous plays, among them Lady Windermere's Fan and the Importance of Being Earnest, and his only novel, The Picture of Dorian Gray. By 1887, Wilde's three-year marriage to chic, intelligent, uh, Constance Lloyd quickly produced two sons, Cyril aged two and Vivian one. They settled in a newly built house in, in Tite Street in fashionable Chelsea, and among their neighbors was the artist James Whitler, Whistler. Oscar Wilde attended the Buffalo Bills Wild West at Earl's Court on May 14th. Wilde found something both authentic and mythic in the West's representation of the American culture. Prior to the Wild uh, arrival of the Wild West, Wild wrote of the American invasion. English people were far more civilized and uh, were far more interested in American barbarism than they are in American civilization. The cities of America are in inexpressibly tedious. Better the far west with its grizzly bears and its untamed cowboys, its free open air and its free open air manners, its boundless prairie and its boundless mendacity. This is what Buffalo Bill is going to bring to London and we have no doubt that London will fully appreciate the show. The handwritten note to T at the regular Wednesday at home of, of the Wilds was really a matter of great pride to Cody. And Cody loved children and Wilde adored his sons. Although after his son Cyril was born, a New York paper quipped that Oscar Wilde regrets that his son is not a daughter because girls drape so much better. So Wilde taking tea on Tite Street may seem incongruous, but no more to Oscar Wilde lighting a cigar and drinking all the whiskey in a Leadville mine shaft. The Wild West encampment behind Earl's Court offered a unique opportunity to entertain. On Sundays, he hosted grub steak breakfast for dignitaries to dine um, with the cast and the crew. Although he had an apartment available in the neighborhood, Cody's private tent behind the arena was located among the Indian Village cowboy camp and staff quarters. And I don't know if this has ever been reproduced in a, in a museum exhibition, but this would be wonderful. As if curated from a well-heeled theatrical set of Scouts of the Plains, the tent was divided into a parlor and bedroom. Beautiful rugs adorned the wooden floor with the skins of both grizzly and mountain lion guarding the door. The chairs were polished buffalo horn, upholstered in soft fur. Precious relics from his adventures covered tables and walls, including beaded Indian belts, iron point arrows, and the knife with which he claimed to have killed Yellow Hair, the first scout for Custer. 
In contrast, the sleeping area softened the pavilion with a, a bed covered with the richest lace. With all the accoutrement of London's finest hotels, hot and cold water, fine pictures, luxurious furnishings, Cody was surrounded by the creature comforts of his own belongings. On his dressing table, a riot of scented invitations stamped with armorial bearings at various receptions, dinners, and balls requesting the pleasure of Colonel Cody's company. Photographer of the Prince and Princess of Wales, Ellen Terry and Henry Irving, are, uh, grace the, man, the mantelpiece, visitors all to Buffalo Bill's tent. Henry Irving invited Irv, Cody and company to the Lyceum for both theatrical entertainment and late night suppers. For large gatherings, dinners in the round were arranged for, at the Lyceum's main stage. Cody probably preferred the Lyceum's more intimate beefsteak room. Another benefit of the beefsteak room is women were welcome. As dinner at, is described as in the diary of Lord Ronald Gower, one enters through the back of the stage. The walls are covered with armor and well, weapons of all sorts, more or less genuine. The supper was, as always, Irving's most sumptuous, but very long, and it was past four in the morning when we parted, and broad sunlight flooded the streets as I walked home. When Ellen Terry arrived the costume, in costume to sit for the American painter John Singer Sargent in his Tight Street studio, Oscar Wilde recalled seeing her as an iridescent figure on approach. Terry consented to sit for her portrait only if her performance in Irving's Macbeth was successful. Her blue-green gown was made to appear to look like soft chain armor and the scales of a serpent sewn all over with real beetle wings. Wilde wrote, the street on that wet and dreary morning has vouchsafed the vision of Lady Macbeth in full regalia, magnificently seated in a four-wheeler, can never be as other streets. It must <clears throat> always be full of wonderful possibilities. Irving destroyed a sergeant sketch of him, but purchased sergeant, uh, sergeant's oil painting, Terry as Lady Macbeth, to hang over the fireplace in the beefsteak room. So imagine the, ima the glamorous cacophony of Cody, seated in a place of honor among posh, bohemian London crowd of actors, writers, politicians, and nobles. The room falls silent as Ellen Terry enters. With all eyes on her, she is seated er opposite Irving under the sergeant painting with all the authority of a Scandinavian queen. Oscar Wilde's downfall would start to occur in 1892, just when his star was rising. After becoming seriously involved with Lord Alfred Douglas, Bosey as he was called, his father, the Marquis of Queensbury, publicly accused Wilde of sodomy. Wilde foolishly sued for libel and lost, which cost him Constance, his sons, Tite Street, and his reputation. Only a few stood by him. In 1895, Oscar, Wilde, the toast of London and Leadville, was sentenced to two years of hard labor for extensive corruptions of the most hideous kind. Ellen Terry and Henry Irving had dined at Tite Street and entertained Wilde at the beefsteak room, and of the many missives urging Wilde to flee England, an unsigned note of support with a spray of violets was left at his door, presumably from them. Bram Stoker and his wife Florence, who had Fields Wilde's offer of marriage many years before included Oscar Wilde at their Sunday at homes. The details of Wilde's trial and imprisonment were covered internationally, and William F. Cody would have certainly heard about it, but it is unknown if he ever commented. And in a review following a Wilde uh, Colorado lecture, the editor, obsessed with Oscar's awkward girth and mode of dress, presciently forebode that Oscar Wilde was intended for manual hard labor instead of the impractical search for the beautiful. At 46, Wilde would die penniless away from London, mostly friendless, not knowing the whereabouts of his sons, preceded in death by his parents, his brother, and poor Constance too. When Henry Irving died in 1905, Bram Stoker was not included among his pallbearers. Akin to a grieving partner, Stoker received condolence telegrams from around the world in including from an empathetic John Burke, Wild West general manager, whose life mission was similarly devoted to the man and industry that was William F. Cody. Deepest sympathy for your loss of friend Irving, a man for generations to be mourned and for posterity to revere. In 1917, a little over a decade later, Burke would die three months after the death of Cody. And Bram Stoker later passed away, not knowing that the eventual success of his Dracula franchise would assure him more posthumous fame than Henry Irving or Buffalo Bill. The sergeant portrait of 
Ellen Terry as Lady Macbeth, which formerly hung in the Lyceum's beefsteak room, is now exhibited at the National Portrait Gallery. Cody's own star would dim as lurid details of his failed attempts to divorce his wife Louisa were wildly purported. As we know, he died in Denver, nearly broke in 1917. <coughs> William F. Cody took many progressive positions in life. He was a suffragist believing in a woman's right to vote. He lobbied for the rights of Native Americans. He was also an environmentalist. In addition to being a scout, a Pony Express rider, and an infantryman, Buffalo Bill had a tender and sentimental heart. He wept openly. He loved his sisters and cherished his children, was a devout friend to men and women alike, and generous to them all to his own financial detriment. He extended his hand in friendship to many unique individuals who operated outside the norms of traditional society for his time. In 1917, the year he passed away, the term homosexual was only seven years old in the public vernacular. Is it possible that Cody's demonstrated largesse also extended to men and women with same-sex orientation? Well, in my opinion, it did. Now more than ever, the men and women of my community need allies like Buffalo Bill. The Discuss Q Club mass shooting in Colorado Springs underscores this. We need powerful allies. To quote the great Western historian Patricia Limerick, we are desperately in need of a Buffalo Bill style of rescue. I'm going to close with a passage I found in a remarkable article in Outdoor Life, a magazine of the West called In the Heart of the Rockies with Cody. Writer Irving R. Baker reports that on 1903 never-to-be-forgotten trip on the headwaters of the Shoshone with Buffalo Bill, Mr. Baker happens upon Cody and Frank Powell, White Beaver, his best friend since childhood in a peaceful moment by a roaring fire. Quietly arising, I peeped through the cabin door and saw a slight never to be forgotten, a sight never to be forgotten. There sat the two men, clasping each other's hands and went within their hearts, ratifying the brotherhood beginning nearly 40 years ago. Long association with Western men has taught me that nearly all of them are tender-hearted. As I saw them in the glow of the firelight, Cody suddenly arising and slapping Powell on the shoulder. This artist will think we're growing sentimental in our old age, Frank. Well, I guess the young man understands us pretty well, Will, replied Powell. Undoubtedly, he is still having his daydreams and not begrudges hours of the evening. A photo clutching the hand of Powell, Cody, is contained in the article. Thank you. Well, thanks, Gregory. So um, I have a couple of questions for Gregory, and then I'll uh, open it up um, for anybody that has uh, questions they'd like to ask. First, um, as I mentioned earlier, this building was formerly the Golden Junior High, which you attended as a seventh grader. So what memories does it conjure up for you as you speak here tonight? Well, they were complicated memories, I have to say. Um, we were, and some of my friends are here, uh, lived in Green Mountain, and uh, so we were bused from Green Mountain over to Golden uh, before our new junior high was being built. And, and I was uh, uh, kind of full of myself a bit because I'd been a straight A student and class president, and I just really looked forward to a successful junior high career. And uh, uh, puberty, and uh, I'm, I'm afraid to say Golden Junior High kind of changed that. Um, first place, uh, we had a gym teacher, and we, uh, and, uh, and he was, this is just a, a weird memory that I think of often. I was, the only thing I was good at athletically was, was running. I couldn't throw a ball worth anything, but I could run. So at the end of exercise, we were always told to run around the, the gym for 10 laps or whatever, and I won. And so the coach says, well, if Greg Hinton can beat you, you all have to run 10 more laps and he can go to the shower. So, uh, and that didn't make me very popular. Uh, and we changed classes. I mean, as grade schoolers, you don't, maybe you do now, but we didn't change classes in grade school. You're in the same room all day long, except for Jim probably. But so we had to move around. And so you can, 
I mean, this is a beautiful building, and the staircase is up and down. So I remember, and, and we had to carry all of our books, and it was easier, I thought, to carry my books like this. And again, I didn't have any, you know, who, who was going to teach me this. So I was carrying my books down the staircase, and it's the first time I was assaulted for being perceived as effeminate. Because some guy slugged me really hard in the books um, and said, you carry like, your, your books like a girl. And then we had the long ride bus home to Green Mountain, which would, you know, people would get, you know, hazed on the bus and I, this would happen to me. And my, my gym clothes were pulled out and tossed all over the back and forth. And, um, and it, it was, like I say, it was just the first time I really remember feeling such humiliation. And there were, we called them hoods in the day, I don't know if you remember this, but there would be tough kids. And one night in my neighborhood in Green Mountain, I went walking and uh, I saw three of the guys who hassled me on the bus at the bottom of the hill. And I, I knew I shouldn't turn around because they'd run after me. So I, I, I decided I would just walk down the hill. And um, one of them said, hey, you got to fight us. I said, I, I'm not fighting anyone, I'm not fighting three people. Well, you got to fight him then. And I said, no, I'm not fighting anyone. And uh, so I kept walking and uh, I, all of a sudden they're behind me and on my back, it's bam, bam, bam. I managed to make it all the way home. If I had told my father, we had 40 firearms in our basement <laughs> and he was, a, he was just such a tough old guy, uh, he would have been down the hill defending his son. So this is, part of what I remember about Golden Junior High. <laughs> Other than we had a 5.0 earthquake during, in science class, which I thought that was interesting. Um, and uh, I always, you know, when I come back to Colorado and you're driving on 6th, and I look down, because we had, the track was blocks away, we didn't have one here. So we would run the track. And I always remember how much I loved running on that track. So, so that's, a, that's a good, good, uh, so that's a good memory. So, but I, it's all made up to me now for being invited back to speak here with you guys. <laughs> well, we're so glad you came and glad that happened. Sure. Um, I have a, the next question is museum related. Um, and then we'll get to a Cody question and I'm sure we'll have some Cody questions from the audience. But uh, Rock Mount Ranchware, a family owned business here in Denver that was founded in 1946. Um, is considered the pioneer of modern, on authentic Western wear. And tell us about the Rock Mount, uh, sorry, the Rock Mount cowboy shirts worn by Heath Ledger and Jake Gyllenhaal in Brokeback Mountain and the journey they inspired you to take without West. Well, I don't know if any of you have ever been to Los Angeles to the Autry Museum of Western Art, but it's really spectacular. And this was near Disney, where I was working with a, a film company at the time. So, and it was kind of, I watched it being built. And so I went in, of course, and um, I was looking around. And because it was Gene Autry, they had a really extensive uh, uh, film gallery, you know, starting from Tom Mix all the way to Kevin Costner and Dances with Wolves. And I'm looking around and I go, well, why isn't Brokeback Mountain represented here? And I kind of knew the answer, but. Um, and that's the Annie, that's the Ang Lee film uh, about two uh, gay cowboys in, in the wilds of Wyoming. And uh, I thought, I, I went home, I just, I, it wasn't any of my business, I wasn't doing this then, but I just thought, well, what would be a great exhibit? And I, I went home and I asked my partner, whatever happened to those shirts from Brokeback Mountain? And he said, I think they were auctioned. And I looked them up and they've been auctioned for $100,000 and paid for by a Hollywood memorabilia collector named Tom Gregory. And I found a generic email. I email anybody that I feel like, which is a quality I have. I don't, I, 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 I don't invest in the return, but uh, I, I, I have an idea and I, I like to go after it. So, and my partner Tom said, he's gonna, he said, I, I emailed him and I said, it's none of my business, but I think your broke back shirts belong in the Autry. And, uh, and this was on New Year's Day. And Tom says, he's gonna think you're an idiot. And the next day I get a reply from Tom Gregory, also named Tom, he said, meet me tomorrow, I'm interested. So 
we met, and he's, I told him kind of what I did and what my background was, and, and he was a wonderful guy. And uh, he was also partnered with a dot-com billionaire, um, like many, I don't know if you know this, but a lot of dot-com billionaires are gay. So uh, he was, this was one set. And uh, so I went home and I thought about it, and then I thought, well, I need another angle. I think I need one more thing. And then I, I'd been to one gay rodeo uh, at the Equestrian Center in Los Angeles, and I was a kid, I was born in the shadow of ro rodeo, both in Wolf Point, Montana, and Cody, Wyoming, the world-famous Cody Stampede. And I thought, well, I wonder if they have, if they have archives or papers, because museums love all that stuff. So I looked it up online, wrote a letter to the president. It's none of my business, but if you have archives and papers, I think they belong in the Autry Museum, because the, buff because the broke back shirts are going there. Called me back. Sure, we have archives. They're in Denver, in the basement of a gay country western bar called Charlie's. Uh, they're in a closet off the drag show dressing room. So I tell this, so I, I have a friend at the Autry, Marva Felchlin, who is the head librarian, just wonderful. And she was kind of working the Autry's end of this, trying to make this happen. So I was sent to Denver to go inspect the, uh, the uh, papers. And sure enough, you go down these stairs, we, we go through the drag show dressing room with the makeup mirrors and all of that, and I recognize a woman, a, a performer that I knew from the past. And sitting on the kegs were this pristine collection of papers, because gay cowboys are, are very, very, you know, they're very organized. And um, <laughs> that's a stereotype, but I think it's a bad one. So they're all sitting there on these kegs, and there were like 10 of them. And I looked through them, reported back, and then two weeks later, and this is, I'm sorry, a long story, but I'll finish here. Two weeks later, with Mrs. Jean Autry, attending and all of the media, the broke back shirts, which were intertwined, were installed in, in the Autry Film Gallery and uh, with Gay Rodeo and everybody who ever heard attending, because was, this was a Tuesday morning and the, the press was everywhere for this because it was so unusual. And then two weeks later, the, the Gay Rodeo archives were driven across the Rockies. They didn't want to send them because they thought that they would be tampered with or ruined. So they drove them, two cowboys drove them themselves, and I was there when uh, um, they were received at the loading dock of the Autry Museum. And so <clears throat> these, uh, these, two, uh, these two artifacts uh, have been the gift that keeps on giving to our community. And that's basically what started my Out West programming. Thanks, and thanks for sharing those connections with us and, and your, those connections with Denver. No, it's, uh, Denver's uh, very, very important. To... So in uh, your talk, you posed that Buffalo Bill was accepting of diverse communities and lifestyle. What makes you think that, and why is that especially important now? Um, I think that because I've been really privileged to work with some, some wonderful curators and, and, uh, and, um, uh, and historians in my travels with Out West. And most of them are straight men of faith. Um, and I just, I just have been so impressed by their embrace of my mission, particularly up in Wyoming. And I think that if they think that this was okay, and they're scholars of Cody, that I could take their word for it, that, that Cody was accepting of all kinds of folk, as long as they paid him back, I think. But uh, no. Um, uh, and. Uh, uh, he had, Cody had uh, drag show performers in the Wild West. I haven't, I, I haven't looked at that that carefully, but I, I just honestly do believe that, uh, that uh, Cody, Cody uh, would, have, would have been accepting, and he, he, he was a man of the times. And, uh, and I was really privileged to be a kid. I, I attended the groundbreaking of the, uh, of the uh, Whitney Gallery of the American West in, when I was six years old in Cody. And, uh, uh, 
I, I just, that's when it just really impressed me about Cody and the Gertrude Vanderbilt Whitney statue of Buffalo Bill, which we all played under, you don't touch bronze now these days, I hear, but, uh, but we were all over it. And so Cody was just, he was just this larger than life character and he, he seemed like the protector of all of us. And I, I think that that's why I, uh, I, I, I think that uh, he, would have, he would have been an ally. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, so now we will open it up to questions. Um, we have a microphone on either side if anybody has some questions that you'd like to ask. Just come on up to the mic. OK, so I have two questions. My first one is, um, what is the museum in Los Angeles that uh, has received these shirts? Uh, the uh, uh, Autry Museum of the American West. Okay. And it's in Griffith Park uh, uh, in, in the valley. It's very, very, very beautiful. And I had one more question just for you. Um, sure. So when did you like, begin to become a historian for Buffalo Bill? Um, I honestly really pulled it out of my hat. Um, I was, I, I'd been in the film industry and I'd, I'd made films. I'd, I'd had several novels published about stories of my community, and um, and I was a lone wolf. I, I was an independent person, and it just uh, uh, it it just occurred to me that our stories weren't being included, and because I had this Western background, and, and uh, uh, it, I, I I I felt that. I don't, I don't, I don't, I can't imagine my gall in all of this. It's just been gall all the way, like uninformed, you know, just ask. And, um, and so people have answered. So, so that's, that's, uh, that's, I'm, I'm, did I, did I answer your question? Yes, thank you. Sure, thank you. So Greg, um, so I had a chance to see the, uh, the, performance in uh, Cheyenne of Sissy uh, in Wyoming. And I was just wondering, like, what's next? You know, there's oh. this pre presentation, and then do you have anything else in the hopper? That sure. Um, what Patty's talking about is I, I wrote a, a verbatim piece that was drawn from uh, uh, an oral history that the American Heritage uh, Center took of the wife of a beloved Wyoming cross-dresser named Sissy Goodwin. So I drew directly from the transfix scripts of Vicky's uh, uh, oral history and 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 pressed them into a like a 60-minute verbatim piece told told in Sissy's uh, point of view. And I again, the state of Wyoming bought it. Um, <laughs> we ended up booking a nine-city tour around the state of Wyoming. Vicky and I drove. The Washington Post heard about it and wanted to know if they could ride along. So they rode in the back seat while Vicki and I went from Sheridan, from Laramie to Cheyenne to Sheridan to Cody to, to, uh, to uh, Jackson to Rock Springs to Riverton to Casper and Douglas and, and, and home again. And it was, people just loved it. And so I really love, I, I'm obviously, I'm, I'm, I would rather read my own plays than probably give a lecture because uh, I can be on book and sit down most of the time, but, and, and I could have here too. But, uh, but uh, what's next for me is I've invited by the Buffalo Bill Center of the West to come up. They're doing an Alfred Jacob Miller exhibition on uh, the 1837 uh, uh, Trapper's Rendezvous. And so uh, I obtained all the letters to, he's a wonderful painter and he wrote, he wrote notes to all of his paintings and I was able to see them at the Gilcrease Museum in Oklahoma and, and manage them, and they're so beautiful. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna draw from his, his notes and, and create a 30-minute a, 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 a uh, a verbatim piece in Alfred Jacob Miller's voice, which I'm gonna present this summer. Uh, what will that be? Uh, so well, I was gonna say, when he says that's his next project, he's leaving at six o'clock in the morning to drive to Cody. Uh, yes, tomorrow. Literally, yes. it's his next project. <laughs> so, uh, I'm sorry, what was the question? When, when will that be 
Um, I believe it's June, June 22nd, and it's based a lot on, on uh, Cody's experiences in, in Scotland as well. I, I don't know. Steve, are you participating in that? No. Oh, okay. Steve, you're welcome to come up to the microphone and answer the question. <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So in any case, it's, uh, it's going to be a... It's going to be a big deal, yeah. So uh, I think in, in your research, you, of course, have run across Rosa Bonheur, who is another example of Cody's openness. And I wondered if you'd care to tell people here a little bit about that. Thank you for reminding this 70-year-old bald mind, because it's, a, it's a very important. I, I, and, I, I and Steve, deeply resemble that remark. <laughs> <laughs> and Steve knows well about my, my uh, research with that, because he was so helpful. But um, some of you may know of a, of a former uh, director of the Buffalo Bill Museum and also a great Western scholar, Paul Fees. Um, when I approached the museum up in Cody about doing this kind of work, I frankly didn't know if I'd find anybody, you know. Um, and I, and Paul, uh, I, Paul invited me to the Proud Cut on, on, on Sheridan Avenue in Cody. And, and I, I said, I, I, I don't, I don't, what, who am I, what am I going to do? And he goes, well, I think you should look at Rosa Bonheur. And uh, Rosa Bonheur is, of course, the very famous painter, an animal you're a French painter, uh, who's uh, best known for her painting The Horse Fair, which uh, 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 Cornelius Vanderbilt bought and, uh, and, uh, and is, is travels everywhere. But, but uh, 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 she's her story is, is really remarkable. She was she was raised she was she loved horses anything with horses and uh, she was not interested in getting married. She had a devoted companion named Natalie Mikas, um, and she uh, and uh, Cody uh, met her uh, at the World's Fair in Paris uh, behind the scenes of the Wild West, and they took a liking to each other. And what I really love is that the two most iconic images of Cody were painted by women. Um, uh, Rosa Bonheur for Buffalo Bill and on his horse Tucker, and Gertrude Vanderbilt Whitney, the statue of Buffalo Bill. I just think it's really great, because these images are reproduced in posters everywhere. So uh, uh, that's what Rosa Bonheur uh, gave uh, Western art. and. Uh, and uh, her, her paintings are, are really, really very beautiful. And we have a copy of um, an image of Cody with Rosa Bonner outside his tent. Right, right. In the Buffalo Bell Museum and Grave. I'll look at that. And, and Cody knew about his rela her relationship with Natalie Meeks. I mean, he was just, he was, I think, a down guy, you know. Thank you for a wonderful evening. And I have a quote attributed uh, to Oscar Wilde that I wonder if you could comment on. Women are for loving, not for understanding. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think he means you're going to comment on that. <laughs> I have to say, this has been the most uh, entertaining, politically incorrect gathering I have attended in a long time. <laughs> Because everything you could say could really piss somebody off, and, <laughs> and I and if I'm challenged yet, I do apologize because uh, I, I welcome. But I just I really have thought uh, that it's uh, it's we, we've really pushed a lot of buttons uh, uh, tonight here uh, in in this beautiful uh, space. Uh, but uh, I I really don't have any comment. I, <laughs> I think that's good. <laughs> Currently, right now, the uh, Buffalo Bell Museum and Grave, I'm the director, and our curator is a female, too. Exactly. So, yeah, so. Rebecca. So on your way out tonight, she's out in the lobby, and she actually has some of the artifacts that you saw in um, the presentation. She has them on carts out there. And um, I know, I don't know, she, oh, she is in here. She, she would totally empathize with those men who drove that collection across town. Um, I mean, across the country, um, because I can tell you right now, she moved the carts with all those things in here, and they're with her in the back of the room, and nice. right before yeah. we disperse, she'll take them back outside. But she, um, 
yeah, she's a great caretaker, and uh, it's, uh, so fits well with that. It does. It's uh, thank goodness. Um, do you have a question? Yes, sir. I got two. I hope they're simple. The first one is there uh, a Buffalo Bill Jr. that was an actor in Hollywood that's related to Buffalo Bill? That I, I frankly don't know. Okay. There, there was. Can you all hear? Yeah. <laughs> uh, there was a Buffalo Bill Jr. and the only resemblance he had to Buffalo Bill or familial connection, if there would be any, would be that he had been a Buffalo Bill. I was going to say the name. <laughs> the name was really about it, but he was only one in a long line of people who have exploited sometimes correctly and sometimes very incorrectly. <laughs> Uh, any association with Buffalo Bill. During Buffalo Bill's life, there were people pretending to be him. And I, it is my belief that some of the bad stories you hear about Buffalo Bill, when you hear them, may have been the other guy. <laughs> <laughs> at least one case, Buffalo Bill was claimed to have murdered somebody. It, was, it happened in Texas, and he was in San Francisco at the time, and the guy claimed to be him. Thank you for and that. And what was your second question? Uh, Thanks, Steve. Well, I, I'm, I'm familiar with the Autry Museum in, in uh, L.A., right across from the zoo. And I'm sure you're probably aware that every month, every couple months, there's a gathering there of uh, people that uh, reminisce and gather oh, with I... the old-time uh, Western movie stars. It's run by a guy by the name of Rob Word. Have you ever heard of him? I, I haven't, no. A word on Westerns. Well, that isn't my question. The question, as a matter of fact, help me out here. I'm a native of Colorado. I grew up here. I may well be older than you if you're 70. Uh, as a matter of fact, where's Buffalo Bill buried? I can answer that. I'll take that on. I'm going to take that on. <laughs> so we know that he's buried on Lookout Mountain. Heart Mountain and Cody. <laughs> <laughs> and um, and uh, not just because of all the great documentation we have at the museum, but um, I, I sometimes share this in public. Uh, my husband, who's here tonight, is actually the grand nephew of uh, Joseph Bona, who was the undertaker who worked on Buffalo Bill. <laughs> and um, true story, uh, my, uh, my father-in-law was babysat in the Olinger Mortuary by his beloved uncle. Yep. Well, um, grew up hearing stories about how um, how uh, Bona um, interned Cody. Um, he actually uh, had a house up in Indian Hills. Joseph Bona did called Bona Bona Venture. Um, <laughs> he was he was the rich relative of this poor really? wow. Irish Catholic family in Denver, and so my father-in-law's fond memories of having vacations were actually going up to Indian Hills and staying at his uncle's house. Um, but I know that, so because um, we have oral histories from my husband's great uncle, and he talks about, um, talks about actually carrying him down the stairs on a stretcher. Um, not all the story was pleasant. Apparently, rigor mortis had started to set in, and this is what he says in the oral history that they actually dropped him and they heard his back snap. And then they picked him back up, put him on the, on the stretcher or whatever it was, put a wig back on his head and carried him back the rest of the way around the stairs um, and tried to make him look as presentable as they could as they carried him past his sister. And then they took him to Olinger and uh, and uh, he worked, Joseph worked on him for, um, from January till he was buried in June. And now you can go to Olinger's and, or you can go to Linger's and have dinner and think about that story. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, thank you for that. And I do have my hearing aids in, but I still didn't get the answer. Is he on Lookout Mountain here? He's on Lookout Mountain <laughs> with his wife. Thank you. <laughs> I think you um, missed some really important facts about Rosa, right? Like, I think that that's like the most compelling and interesting part. I mean, she was painted, that was great, but maybe you could expound on. Uh, Rosa Bonner? Yes. Um, the, 
lesbian artist in France? Well, yeah, I think he missed some of her flair that she maybe Cody found interesting. Oh, I don't know if Cody I was attracted to her. Well, no, not like attracted. Oh. I'm just saying, like, like she wasn't of your age. Like she dressed up like a dude, right? She was like one uh, of the well, she she was. Uh, she could work in work clothes, but it was not legal for her to go out right. in public uh, unless she was uh, uh, dressed kind of in the in the in the dress of the day. I, I'm, I'm, my memory's jogged now. Thank you, because she she had to obtain a permit uh, to dress like a man uh, from the French government each year, um, as long as she didn't go out. And, actually, in her own home, I believe right. she needed. Thank you. Uh, uh, in 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 her own home, she could she could dress like in slacks, but not out in public. Um, and well, and I thought that was important because no, he's you. been no, like I... you know trying to go with different flows all the time, and that was a big flow back then, right? Like no, to I... wear britches or whatever they called them. I don't know. No, absolutely. And um, Cody, somebody had given her a horse called something. Oh, yeah. yeah. And um, uh, uh, and and Cody and, and she couldn't she didn't want it and she wanted to give it to Cody because it was just, it was too wild it wouldn't sit still enough for her to paint and um, and so I believe that he he took it uh, he took it back to uh, to wherever he went with it uh, but he ended up breaking the horse and it ended up being in in, in one of his shows um, but. Um, I, something just went out of my head about her. She's really a fascinating, great character. Um, uh, the Museum of Wildlife Art up in Jackson has a wonderful piece of hers. Um, but uh, uh, when, when Natalie, oh, this is thing. Um, I'll cry again with this, so just bear with me. When Natalie Mikas passed away, she wrote um, how heartbroken she was to lose a friend like hers. And the reason she loved Cody was she met him right after, she met him at the World's Fair in Paris right after she died. And she had said that Colonel Cody was so kind to me. Um, he relieved uh, this, uh, this, this sad old mind. Uh, that, that's what, what, what drew her out of that. So, um, and she, um, uh, when Natalie died, another, another young woman came and took her she oh she came with the guy who was looking he was trying to find the horse he gave to Rosa Benor and it was gone, but Natalie took a liking to the young woman who who came with her, and uh, they ended up cohabitating, and she ended up inheriting all of Natal of, of Rosa Benor's oh right Rosa Benor's uh, uh, fortune, um, and freaked out her family and so she agreed to give half of it but uh, but it's it's all of that I mean if you just think that women couldn't couldn't, were forced by law and could get ticketed for wearing a dress. And, and uh, uh, so it's hard enough for a man to wear one. So <laughs> anyway, I digress. But thank you for jogging my memory. I appreciate it. Hi, um, can you hear me? You say you'd like an ally like Buffalo Bill. Um, what do you mean by that? And do you not feel you um, aren't represented or have allies currently? Well, flash forward to present day, and I'll tell you, uh, if I may just tell you these a couple of incidents. Um, I live right in the heart of Hollywood, if any of you have been there near the, where Lucy and Ethel stole John Wayne's footprints. Um, Chinese theater is there, and so we live in kind of this little quiet area adjacent to that. So I walk to, or we have a grocery, and I like to walk to get groceries. So uh, a couple years ago, I was walking down Sunset Boulevard, lugging two bags of groceries, and Somebody sails up behind me on a bike. I'm, I forgive the language, but it's important to share it with you what it was. He goes, he goes, hey, you fat faggot, I want to slit your throat while your boyfriend watches. And then he just kept going. I was afraid he was going to cold cock me, but instead he kicked uh, seven of those bird scooters lined up into the street and just kept going. So a couple months ago, or no, a month ago, I. I uh, was going, we have a great metro system, Underground Railroad. railroad. So I, uh, a friend from Houston was coming for, for, for a conference and I wanted to go down to meet her in downtown LA and I could just shoot down there in 10 minutes. So I go down into the 
into the you know terminal where the where the trains come and it was very quiet there was just a couple of people there and i've always been kind of creeped out about it you know you because you can look right into the tracks you could fall in front of a train really easily so whatever so i was standing behind a pillar but my shoulder was slightly out and all of a sudden i get slugged in the back um and this guy dances away and and i'm just like like you know I don't know if you've ever been assaulted, but it's really shocking because you're kind of out of body like this guy just hit, you're doing all of this stuff going on in your head and you've actually just whatever you're, you're in shock. So I didn't know what to do. I just wanted to see my friend and he, he, he hit me and left. And then I just uh, I got on I got on the train uh, that pulled up and then we're going along and I realize he's standing next to me. So at the next stop, Hollywood in Vermont, um, the door opens and there's a cop standing there and I just decided to get off and I reported that I had been assaulted. So they held the train, took the guy off, talked to him, seven cops with him and I was, one guy stood with me and, and he went and talked to him and he, they said, I, I, they, want to, they want to know if you want to press charges. And I just, he was this young, stupid kid and I just said, no, I, I just don't want to do that. I'm, I'm okay, but I just can't not be hit and say something about it. I, I can't be hit and not say something about it. And uh, so that's, um, they have a term and it's called walking around while gay. And I've, I have to accept the fact, and I don't know what characteristic I, I, I kick off and but I am a senior gay man and I'm now a mark. I have to be responsible and look down streets. I mean, that's, I'm not saying I'm, I'm paranoid, I'm not gonna stop going out, but I have to accept, um, there's uh, another, no, uh, two other incidents, just people calling me faggot while I'm walking down, you know, doing whatever. And I like, it's so, really some of the best advocacy or allies we can have are the unpredictable ones, the ones that you wouldn't expect. Um, and that's, that's why I, I just, that, that, that photograph of, of Cody racing across the, you know, racing across the, the field is just so beautiful. And it's just like Buffalo Bill to the, to the rescue. And uh, I'm, I'm, that's a fantasy in my mind, but uh, um, I like, I just, if you have, if you have friends, and I just prefer to call them my community, or know people who have children, just reach out, be a pal. It um, uh, doesn't have to be any, any great underscoring of it. It's just, you know, be friendly with the parents and the family and, and make them, you know, just make, make these young kids feel welcome if you get a chance. Um, so so that's, that's really kind of what my goal would be. Just a couple more questions. Um, so what was the famous quote that Oscar Wilde said as he stepped off the boat in New York? He said um, he was disappointed in the Atlantic Ocean. But it was, he didn't have anything to, uh, uh, to declare, correct? Oh, uh, forgive me, if you know it. Uh, I don't know it. I, I, I know what you're talking about. I, I, I can't recall it. Customs officer asked him if he had anything to declare, and he said, "I have nothing to declare except my genius." There you go. That's right. <laughs> That's great. And um, Thanks, second question for you. Um, so, Colonel Cody, how did he get his rank? Oh, um, uh, so he got that from the governor of Nebraska, and it was bestowed on him before he traveled. Um, Everett probably knows the answer. Eight. <laughs> what year, Everett? 1887. Uh, 18, uh, 1887. So uh, he, they, they, he had the rank bestowed on him, so basically he could go to Europe with that rank and be the colonel, a colonel. So. Thank you very much. Thank you. I'm originally from Thermopolis, Wyoming. So. Oh, I love the, the screaming Mimi. Yeah, that's not user-friendly anymore. So. <laughs>
<laughs> I'm going through to Thermopolis tomorrow, so I'll, 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 there you go. No, they had a water slide called the Screaming Mimi that we, we would go to. It was really fun. Probably very dangerous. <laughs> well, great. So, um, Gregory, will you stick around for a couple minutes afterwards? Sure. And um, again, we have, have artifacts in the lobby. If you want to take a look at, at the, actually, there are archival materials. Um, includes a, a pass to um, the horticulture fair in London is out there, and um, some photographs, some other items like that. That's great. Thank you. Thank you all so much. Thank you. Oh, okay.